my friends, patriots, lovers of democracy, truth and justice, believers in peace, freedom and the American way. Tom Hartman here with you. It is Friday, so it's time for Brunch with Bernie. Senator Bernie Sanders, the independent from Vermont, on the line with us, taking your calls. Uh, Senator Sanders, welcome. Good to be with you, Tom. So what's on your mind today? What's, uh, well, let's review uh, a little bit of what's uh, going on in the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think listeners will remember that uh, last week uh, an agreement was reached regarding the presidential president's ability to appoint uh, the EPA director, the uh, Secretary of Labor, uh, members of the National Labor Relations Board, and some other positions. That issue is about whether or not the President of the United States, whoever he or she may be, has the right to make appointments to his cabinet uh, and to put his team together. Uh, the Republicans have been extremely obstructionist on this issue, dragged it out, 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 uh, filibustered the issue, required 60 votes for the issue. Uh, the majority leader, Harry Reid, finally said, I think, uh, long overdue, uh, enough is enough. If you guys keep this up, I am going to uh, ask, change the rules, go for 51 votes, and we're going to get these appointments done. Uh, Republicans responded, this is the end of the world, it's terrible to change the rules, blah, 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 blah. An agreement was reached by which these appointments will be made. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but the broader issue of the dysfunctionality of the Senate was not dealt with. And what that means is the Senate can function, uh, in my view, in either one of two ways. Either you have, in a sense, a gentleman and a gentle lady's agreement that the rules of the Senate will not be abused. And by that I mean uh, the nature of the Senate right now is that if I walk down onto the Senate floor and I say, I object, I don't want uh, legislation to go forward, uh, I can bring, as one senator, the entire Senate and by definition, the Congress, to a halt. Uh, And 99 other senators can do exactly the same thing. If those rules are abused, if people come down and do that time and time again, slow down the process, they are abusing the rules, in my view, and uh, something has got to be done. So either you maintain a gentleman's agreement, so to speak, or then you're going to have to go to new rules, which say, guess what? One person cannot bring the United States Senate to a halt. Guess what? We do not need 60 votes on every single piece of legislation. I think perhaps the most important fact to know is that between 1917 and 1967, the filibuster was used 45 times during a 50-year period. Very, very, very rarely, less than once a year. Since Harry Reid has been majority leader in the last six and a half years, he's had to try to overcome over 400 filibusters. And by a filibuster, I mean not somebody standing on the floor talking, but just somebody says uh, that uh, you're going to need 60 votes to move this legislation. Because we're going to prevent it from going forward unless it has 60 votes. So bottom line here now in the Senate, in my view, is that we're looking at a tyranny of the minority, not majority rule. The minority must have rights to be protected. No debate about that. But right now, the majority is not doing what the American people want. So we are passing legislation, uh, but we need, in the sense of getting over 50 votes, but we cannot get to 60 votes, and very, very, very little gets done. So that's one issue we have to stay on. How do you make the Senate a responsive institution to deal with the enormous problems facing our country of a collapsing middle class, high unemployment, dysfunctional health care system, etc., etc., and how do you do it in a way that the minority cannot prevent good things from happening? Issue number one. Issue number two that we're dealing with right now touches on a major, major problem in the United States, and that is the very high level of student indebtedness. Uh, Student indebtedness in this country now is over a trillion dollars, it is higher than credit card debt. Uh, average student graduating a four-year college is $27,000 in debt. If you go to graduate school, medical school, dental school, it could be you know five, ten times as much as that. I've met dentists who are paying off a $200,000-plus uh, uh, loan. Uh, 
how do we deal with that? Um, a few weeks ago, as a result of previous legislation, uh, what we call the Stafford Subsidized Loan, that is the major loan going to low and moderate income students, the federal loan program, uh, went from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. Many of us voted, here's an example, a majority of us voted to keep it at 3.4 percent. We did not have 60 votes. It went up to 6.8 percent. An agreement is now being, has been agreed to, uh, so-called bipartisan agreement, which I have very serious problems with. It would tie student loans uh, to 10-year Treasury notes. Most people expect interest rates to go up. That could mean that in five or six years, uh, students will be paying 6, 7, 8 percent interest rates uh, on their student loans. And that, I think, is uh, a dumb idea. Uh, given the fact that students already have too much indebtedness, and it will simply discourage young people from going to college, getting the education that they need. So that's an issue uh, that we will be dealing with, I think, early next week. I've got an amendment uh, that I think will significantly improve uh, what is not a good piece of legislation, in my view. A third issue that is being discussed is the whole issue of tax reform. And, uh, you know, when everyone talk, anyone talks about Social Security reform, tax reform, hang on to your wallet, because generally speaking, the big money interests in Washington are going to get what they want. Social Security reform is another word for cutting Social Security benefits, Medicare reform, cutting Medicare benefits, Medicaid benefits, and so forth and so on. Tax reform is another word for giving, in my view, even more tax benefits in a variety of ways uh, to large multinational corporations. One of the reasons that we have a deficit crisis is that uh, over the years, large corporations have been able to get huge tax breaks, including the ability to stash their money in the Cayman Islands and other tax havens, where they're putting billions and billions of dollars, and they don't have to pay a nickel in taxes on that. We're losing about $100 billion a year just from that one uh, provision by which they're able to store their money in the Cayman Islands. So when we talk about tax reform, uh, what you should know is that corporations are now flooding. They are flooding uh, the Congress right now, uh, trying to get even more tax breaks, more benefits, lower tax rates, uh, all of which I think will be a bad, bad thing for this country. One out of four major corporations today pay zero in taxes. Corporations are paying about 12% uh, uh, tax rates on their profits right now. So what you'll hear in the newspapers and, and on television is, oh, my goodness, they have a 35% corporate tax rate. But the answer is that's the nominal rate. Nobody pays it, or very, very, very few people pay it. Sometimes they pay zero. Sometimes they pay 5%. Average, it's about 12%. So what we have seen over the years is corporate contribution as a percentage of total tax revenue is way lower than it used to be, has been picked up by individuals, got problems with the individual tax rates as well. But focusing on uh, corporate taxes to make sure that we have a tax system that is fair, that large profitable corporations, and, and today corporate America is enjoying record-breaking profits, start paying their fair share is uh, also a major issue. Mm. Okay. Um, but just a half a minute left, Bernie. Uh, thoughts on, on Trayvon Martin? Uh, well, I think what you had is a tragedy. I think it gets back... Uh, primarily to, what is it called, uh, Stand Your Ground. Your ground yeah. uh, I, I think that is just an incredibly stupid and dangerous piece of legislation that condones uh, what happened there in Florida. Senator Bernie Sanders with us, taking your calls in our national town hall meeting here on the Town Hartman Program. It's called Brunch with Bernie. Check out Bernie's website at sanders.senate.gov. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And, of course, you can drop into our free live chat room over at TomHartman.com, and we have a free app over in the App Store for iPhones and iPads. Welcome back. Senator Sanders on the line with us, and... Tom, watching us on Free Speech TV in Tucson, Arizona. Tom, you're on the air with the senator. Senator, do we really need a Defense Department anymore? 
Well, I think we do need a defense department, Tom, but I think we do not need to fund them at quite the level that they are uh, being funded. Uh, you know, at a time when so many people in this country are struggling to keep their heads above water, we're talking about uh, people who are going hungry in America, we're talking about elderly people, uh, who can't keep their homes warm in the winter or buy the prescription drugs that they need. Talking about the kids who don't have the job training in order to get out into the workforce. Uh, I can think of a lot better ways to spend money uh, than in many of the ways that we're spending it within the Defense Department. So I think as we look at deficit reduction, uh, taking a hard look at the defense, the defense uh, department and the defense industry uh, is certainly something we should be doing. Jim, watching Free Speech TV in Pioneer, Ohio. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Tom. Great to be with you. I want to talk to Bernie. I want to give him my campaign finance proposal. I, I know Bernie uh, supports public financing. You're on the air with him. Wanna, You're speaking right to him right now. I want to propose a system where for a given election, everyone from the $2 donor to the multi-million dollar donor throws their money into the same pot. Then that money is divided by the number of candidates plus one. Each donor gets to choose a most preferred candidate and a least preferred candidate. The most preferred candidate gets the extra share. The least preferred candidate gets a half a share. The extra money is used to pay for the system and so on. Well, Jim, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. I'm not quite sure that the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson and all these guys who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars buying candidates uh, will necessarily be sympathetic to that idea. Uh, as you've indicated, Jim, I, I believe uh, in, in public funding of elections. Uh, I was just talking a moment ago about corporate tax reform. And right now, right now on Capitol Hill, you've got lobbyists coming out of the woodwork. Uh, they are all over the place uh, trying to make sure that corporations pay less in taxes. Uh, and, and, and the reason that you have a Congress so responsive to the needs of the wealthy and large corporations has everything in the world to do with campaign financing, has everything to do with the disastrous uh, Supreme Court decision in, in Citizens United. So what we need to do in, in terms of campaign financing are, are two things. Number one, we have to overturn Citizens United. Number two, we do have to move to public funding of elections. And that is uh, to understand that in the long run you save a lot more money when people cannot buy, big money interests cannot buy elections. So uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. How would you deal with uh, referendums in that regard? That's a good question. And I think uh, referendums are done at the statewide level. So those are the decisions that would probably have to be dealt with at the state. And I think probably that, uh, you know, my first thought would be if people can show that there's significant support for the issue that they are interested in, uh, you would probably have a limit about it as to the amount of money that could be spent on the campaign and have it publicly funded, have the opposition publicly funded as well. Yeah, makes sense. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. 866-987-THOM. We'll be back with more of your calls for Senator Sanders right after this. Past the hour here on the True People's Media, the Tom Harbin program. It's our brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls in our national town hall meeting. Jason in Washington, D.C., you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hey, guys. Uh, I just realized that the other day the NDA provision is now uh, reestablished so that the military can indefinitely detain any American citizen without there being any due process of the law. I thought I had uh, voted for Obama because he was going to protect our civil liberties, and every time I turn around, it's looking like he's actually worse than Bush. Uh, on a lot of this stuff. As a matter of fact, I don't think it was me, but the ACLU on their 10-year anniversary said that uh, Obama's been terrible on this stuff and is actually worse than Bush, and I was surprised the ACLU said that. So I'm, I'm fearful that we're running down this road of a military type of tyranny or government control of stuff with the censorship of the Internet, the war, war on all of the whistleblowers. What are we going to do to clean up our government? Because it seems like the one thing both Republicans and Democrats don't want is they do not want transparency. 
Well, I think, um, you know, when you ask about how you clean up government, uh, I would rephrase that and say, yeah, clean it up and make it responsive to the needs of ordinary people, not the big money interests who currently control it. Uh, in terms of the whole issue of civil liberties, it is a huge, huge, huge issue. Uh, and I would agree with the assertion that the pres- President Obama has not been good on this issue, to say the least. I think he, has, he inherited a number of programs from Bush, initiated during the Bush era, and in some cases he has expanded those programs. And they, that concerns me very much. But also understand this is not just a government issue. It is a corporate issue. Bottom line here is a, as a result of the explosion of uh, technology in recent years, you know, private companies, government knows just an enormous amount about you. And if we are serious about being a quote-unquote free country or believing in liberty and individual rights, that is an enormously dangerous direction in which to go. Now, what I will tell you is that in terms of uh, the USA Patriot Act and what we heard recently about the fact that every phone, virtually every phone call made in the United States of America is on file, uh, that doesn't mean that they're listening in. It means that uh, there is a record of when you made that call and to whom you made that call. Uh, I think that is absurd. I think, uh, as I've said many times, obviously we want to go after people who will do us harm. We want to go after people who are terrorists. But the idea that you have on file every phone call made in the United States of America when 99.99% of the American people have nothing to do with terrorism is to me dead wrong. So what we are going to do, uh, I believe the strategy is when the Department of Defense reauthorization bill comes up, is work on uh, the USA Patriot Act, specifically Section 215, and tighten that up significantly. And basically to say that if the law enforcement folks or the intelligence people have a reason to believe that somebody is involved in terrorist activity, they go to the court, the FISA court, and they give their reasons. And if the court says you've made your case, go after that person, they go after that person. That is a very different process than having on file every phone call made in the United States and having blanket the, the ability of the government to go into people's websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's kind of what we'll be doing and probably working on an amendment during the uh, Department of Defense reauthorization bill. Dan in San Diego, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Morning, Senator Sanders and Tom. Uh, yeah, I had a question in the uh, IRS investigation. I think Daryl Issa perpetrated a fraud on the country uh, when he claimed that conservative groups were targeted, targeted by the IRS, when the reality is he only asked for uh, data on conservative groups. And I'm wondering, can he be charged uh, with anything? You know, if you recall, uh, when the, the issue first came out, John Boehner asked, uh, who's going to jail? And I, I think ISA should go to jail, or at a minimum, he should be charged with ethics uh, violations and, you know, remove at least from the committee chair. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, it, it, uh, what I could tell you is it certainly is not going to happen. He has, you know, been one of their, um, you know, a very, very aggressive folks. I'm sure he's close to the speaker, so I think he's going to stay in his position. But your point is well taken. What uh, later information I- indicates is that progressive groups have also been impacted uh, by those uh, IRS investigations. But here's the most important point. You know, it gets almost back to the to the uh, Trayvon Martin case, where you have, you know, the stand your ground legislation, which almost, I wouldn't say encourages, but yeah, maybe encourages folks to be much more violent uh, than they otherwise should be. What you have right now in terms of campaign finance You have these stupid laws uh, which are designed to encourage, quote-unquote, social welfare, but which everybody in the world knows that they are meant for campaign finance. So the problem with this whole IRS investigation has to do with campaign funding and ways for people to fund elections and, and the political process in secret. And if we are serious about transparency, and in fact, if you are serious about the political process, we got to end those stupid laws which allow people to put huge amounts of money into the political process without any disclosure at all. That is the remedy to that problem. Okay. Chris in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. I wanted to ask you if, uh, if you would favor 
uh, taking back the money power from the banksters, you know, nationalizing uh, basically money. And we could fund government, local, state, and federal, interest-free. You know, Dennis Kucinich had a bill up that did just that. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, that's not the direction uh, that I, I would go, Chris. Um, this is what I would do. First of all, uh, I believe that um, the economy of the United States, in terms at least of the health and, and welfare of the middle class of this country and working families of this country, uh, is never going to be satisfactorily addressed unless we deal with Wall Street. Uh, and we don't talk about it enough. Uh, I applaud the folks that Occupy Wall Street for focusing on it. They were right. Uh, that effort has got to expand and continue. I guess we'll pick this up after the break. We'll do that. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour, our national town hall meeting with Senator Sanders. You can check out his website, sign up for the Bernie Buzz, read the news of the day over at sanders.senate.gov. Stick around. We'll be right back. 28 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. In our next hour, by the way, Pastor D. Alexander Bullock is going to be back with us talking about the Detroit bankruptcy and what's going on there. And it's an Ingo's Friday. It's where despair is not an option. A marvelous line that I stole from Senator Sanders. <laughs> it's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls on issues of the day. And, Bernie, we, uh, we started with an issue just before we went to break. You want to... Right. Chris called uh, about Wall Street. And while I don't particularly... Uh, wouldn't go in the direction that he proposed, uh, here's what we have to understand. Uh, and, and never forget, not for one day, Wall Street is enormously powerful. I mean, you can talk about the oil companies. You can talk about the high-tech companies information technology companies, all of which are, you know, incredibly powerful. But at the top of that whole list is Wall Street. Uh, I cannot imagine, Tom, almost any piece of legislation uh, passing the Congress or or being uh, uh, supported by the president that Wall Street opposes. Hmm. Uh, These guys, I mean, you, you know, look at legislation when it's passed and find out, uh, you know, Wall Street doesn't stay up nights worrying about guns. They don't worry about gay rights too much or abortion, all that stuff. That's not their issue. But on economic issues, stuff that impacts them, it ain't going to happen. They're just too, too, too powerful. Uh, and here are just a few points that people should be aware of. We bailed out Wall Street, uh, both in terms of the top bailout and huge amounts of zero or low-interest loans from the Fed uh, because of their greed, recklessness, and illegal legal behavior, and because they were too big to fail. Everybody should understand that every one of the major financial institutions, many of them enjoying record-breaking profits right now, is larger than they were before we bailed them out. So if they were too big to be bailed out, then imagine what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Second of all, people should appreciate that the six largest financial institutions have assets equivalent to over $9 trillion dollars. And that is two-thirds of the GDP of the United States of America. That's six financial institutions. And thirdly, of course, we're talking about international capital and the huge impact they're having on economies all over the world. So if you are serious about figuring out how we reverse the collapse of the middle class, how we create a full employment economy, how we make sure that working people enjoy decent wages, how the labor movement becomes revitalized so people have the right to have collective bargaining. If you talk about any or all of these things, you've got to appreciate that the power of Wall Street and their opposition to any and all of these provisions. Interestingly enough, Wall Street, along with uh, other large uh, corporate interests, um, c- constitutes what's called the Business Roundtable. Business Roundtable is an organization of CEOs of the largest corporations uh, in America. And these guys are now promoting the idea that we should raise the retirement age for Social Security and for Medicare to be 70 years of age. In other words, they want to destroy Social Security for millions of people uh, and Medicare as well. Bottom line, there is a class war going on being led by Wall Street. These guys are they are very religious people, but their religion is greed. More, 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 
and they don't care who they destroy uh, if it gets in their way of making even more short-term profits. So, you know, we are, I, among many other things, I have introduced legislation, others have done similar type pieces of legislation to start breaking up these huge financial institutions. If they're too big to fail, they're too big to exist, uh, and we can have, I think, a more competitive economy uh, and certainly dilute the power of these very, very powerful folks if we break them up. John in Venice, California. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. John, if you're Hi. on a speakerphone, you need to pick it up and do it normally. You know, the um, debate right now about the uh, Cassandra ground law, uh, I believe that was paid for through ALEC by the NRA, and sales have gone up in Florida of guns since. I might be wrong about that. Do you understand that to be the case? Well, you know, what ALEC is is another tool of, I think, the Koch brothers. I'm not, uh, I think that's true, Tom. Isn't it the Koch brothers? Probably? Well, the Koch brothers are one of many funders. Yeah, it, right. it, was, it started back it in is. the 80s. I mean, we yeah. it, it's not a conspiracy. What it is is simply, you know, the right-wing groups, Koch brothers and others, come together. And they say, okay, how do we make, corp- how do we make state government more responsive to the needs of the wealthy and the powerful? Uh, how do we break unions? How do we lower environmental standards? How do we cut programs that are of benefit to working people? So what they do through the ALEC program is they come up with a list of kind of generic ideas. They send it out to conservative legislators, right-wing legislators all over the country. They supply the expert witnesses that may be needed for committee hearings and so forth and so on. And the day-to-day political capabilities of getting that legislation through. That's what they do. Uh, you know, this stand your ground stuff, you know, it, it seems to me that what we want is a less violent society. Uh, we know that guns are taking so many innocent lives in this country. Uh, we know that we're a very violent society. To give people more encouragement to, quote unquote, defend yourself, you know, self defense is a basic human right. Somebody attacks you, you have a right, obviously, to defend yourself. But you don't have a right to go shooting somebody because they looked at you in the wrong way uh, or they said something stupid to you. You know, we want to protect human life, not take human life. So I'm not a great fan uh, of this type of legislation. I understand the president just spoke about that coming from a similar tone. Mm, Yeah, he did. John, in Westfield, Vermont, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, Senator. Um, Elizabeth Warren and uh, Senator McCain have starting uh, what I guess you could call a modernized Glass-Siegel Act. Are you going to be a sponsor of of that with them, and are you going to back that uh, attempt to get that through? I think uh, what they're talking about is developing a new type of a Glass-Siegel legislation. Yes, I do support that. Uh, But frankly, I think we have to go further uh, and not only put up walls between commercial and... and, um, uh, investor banks and insurance companies, which is what Glass-Steagall is about, and that's a good thing. But as I said a moment ago, I think you have to break these financial institutions up. That's long-term what we've got to do. But yes, uh, I do support that legislation. Howard, uh, in Hollywood, Florida, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. How are you guys doing? I've got a suggestion. I've made them before. You tend to uh, laugh at them because they're coming a little bit from left field. But I've got a way of challenging the Republicans so that you can pass a jobs bill. They have 35 jobs bill, bills in the Senate that aren't being passed. We've got them in the House in committee. I suggest Obama come forward and make an offer. You pick your best bill in the Senate. You allow us to pick our best bill that's in committee. You bring it out of committee and pass it. We put them both, both in the Senate and pass them simultaneously. That way the Republicans can no longer say that we're in favor of a jobs bill and not do anything, because their jobs bills are ridiculous, most of them that I've read anyway. Right. How is that for making a suggestion? Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I think if the point is to expose the fact uh, that our Republican friends are not seriously interested in dealing with the jobs crisis in America, uh, you're absolutely right. I guess any way that one could expose them, uh, put them on the defensive on that issue, it would be appropriate. Uh, but I think most people understand that. I, I just want to repeat a point, Tom, that I've made before. You know, 
when we talk about the economy today, <clears throat> two basic truths are there. Number one, are we better today than we were when Bush left office? And the answer is yes, we certainly are. We were hemorrhaging 700,000 jobs a month uh, during that period. That is unsustainable. It is total disaster. Today we're growing about 200,000 jobs a month. Not very good, but obviously a lot better than losing 700,000 jobs a month. But having said that, having said that we are making some modest progress, we should not underestimate the seriousness of the financial crisis facing this country in terms of jobs. Real unemployment is not 7.5%. Real unemployment, including those people who have given up looking for work, those people who are working part-time, is close to 14%. If you're young and just have a high school degree, it is a lot higher than that. If you're a person of color, it is a lot higher than that. Furthermore, many of the new jobs that are being created are not 40-hour-a-week jobs. They're 30-hour-a-week jobs. Many of the jobs being created are temporary jobs, not permanent jobs. So we have a major, major jobs crisis in this country that this country, that the Congress has got to address. And it pains me very much that they haven't done that. One of the quick and easy ways that you can start creating millions of jobs <clears throat> is by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. Everybody knows that our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our rail system, airports need enormous amount of work. That work really constitutes all kinds of different jobs. It's not just blue-collar jobs. But we can create a lot of work doing that. We can create work dealing with global warming, moving away from fossil fuel, moving to wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, energy efficiency. Do those things create jobs? Will the Republicans be supportive of that? Sadly, I doubt it. Yeah. Bernie, uh, 30 seconds. Is there any effort to push those things forward that might well, have some sure success? Is. There sure is. I have uh, work, working with the chairman of the Energy Committee, Ron Wyden, and, and others are doing similar type efforts. Uh, Gene Shaheen in New Hampshire has a piece of legislation in, uh, to call for significant spending on energy efficiency. We are wasting huge amounts of money by not having our homes properly weatherized, uh, and we can save consumers money, create jobs, and cut greenhouse gas emissions if we move aggressively in that area. We will be back with more of your questions for Senator Bernie Sanders in our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie, right here on the Tom Harbin program. It's 15 minutes before the hour. Bernie's website is sanders.senate.gov. Uh, and they've got a, a great news site there that's updated on a regular basis every single day. Plus, you can sign up for Bernie's newsletter, Bernie Buzz. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Once again, that's Sanders.Senate.gov. Check it out. Welcome back. Sandy in Fairhope, Alabama, watching us on Free Speech TV. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, good afternoon, Senator. I'd like to ask you a question. I'd like to know why I should believe that I, li I don't live under a fascist government. I mean, I, I, it scares me to see all these things happen in this country, and I feel bad uh, since I grew up in the 50s and 60s to see what's happened, and it really distresses me. Well, Sandy, I think you should be distressed about what's happening to our country for a number of reasons, but that doesn't mean you live in, in a fascist society. And I, I would just be cautious about throwing terminology out there. If you lived in a fascist society after you made that telephone call, somebody would be knocking on your door and picking you up. No one is going to knock on your door and pick you up. Uh, you know, you can write a letter to the editor opposing the president or your governor, and no one's going to arrest you. So I, I think we have, we must focus on, on the real serious problems facing our country in terms of civil liberties, as I mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, it is an outrage to my mind uh, that the NSA and the government are doing what they are doing. We have to watch the private sector as well. In terms of the economy, we're looking at the wealthiest people and the largest corporations doing phenomenally well while the middle class literally is disappearing and poverty is almost as high as it has been in 60 years. All of those are terrible, terrible problems, which we have to focus on. But throwing out the word fascist, I don't, I don't think, helps us in that discussion. What we need to do is say, okay, 
How do we create the millions of jobs that we need? What is the program? How do you make sure that every kid in this country, regardless of income, is able to go to college? How do you do that? What do you do about the incredibly unequal distribution of wealth and income in America, such as that the top 1% owns 38% of financial wealth and the bottom 60% owns 2.3%, and that gap between the very rich, everybody else is growing wider. What do we do about that? So I'm not a great fan of just throwing out, you know, slogans or, or uh, you know, or, 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 or just, uh, you know, words. What we need is an agenda which says, how do we go from here to there? How do we address the problems? How do we educate and organize people uh, to make that happen? That seems to me where we have to go. Uh, Renee in Judah, Wisconsin. We have just a minute to the break. Renee, a quick question, please. Yes, um, thank you for taking my call. Uh, Senator Sanders, um, I had seen a, a, uh, um, a television program that was talking about the um, Chapter 10s that were being given to our soldiers at a record high rate in order to make sure that they are ineligible for their medical and, and uh, social health. Um, so now that they've got these Chapter 10s, we are no longer responsible. Are you looking into this? Uh, Renee, honestly, I am not familiar with that issue, and I apologize uh, to you about that. But obviously, <clears throat> any veteran of this country or any soldier uh, in this country is entitled to certain benefits, including health care. Uh, and they are entitled to get that. So thank you for re- informing me about that, Renee, and I will look into it. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls here in our national town hall meeting. Stick around. We'll be right back with more of your calls for, for Senator Sanders. His website, once again, sanders.senate.gov. Check it out. It's on Hartman program, fair and only slightly unbalanced. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. Uh, it's our brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. Robert in Bothell, Washington. You are on the air, Senator Sanders. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's an honor. I've spoken with Tom several times, but uh, Bernie, I have an idea, and I wanted to run it by you guys. What uh, would happen if somebody slightly independent of Wall Street formed a bank? specializing in low-interest student loans, say the tribal nations or somebody that, you know, would like to do something a little different. Well, Is that feasible? Uh, if the tribes wanted to do that, I suppose, yes. I mean, people have the right to form a bank and develop their own policies. Yes, Robert, I think that is feasible. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, I am very, very, very worried about these high interest rates that young people are now and their families are being forced to pay. We want to encourage people to go to college, not discourage them. So uh, you've, you've thrown out an idea. Uh, Tom, you know, when Robert was talking, he mentioned an idea. I just want to repeat something. Uh, I think I've made this point before. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, citizens' ideas have an impact. Um, you may or may not recall that a couple of years ago on this program, a woman called up who was a veteran. She said, I walked into a veteran's uh, hospital, VA hospital. I was really upset. I went to the gift shop, and most of the stuff there was made in China or was not made in America. Uh, Well, I'm chairman of the Veterans Committee right now, uh, and we have worked on that issue. And I hope that that woman who called goes into her local VA hospital and notices a difference because the VA's uh, contractor now is moving fairly aggressively to make sure that we have more made-in-America products uh, in our VA uh, hospitals and facilities. Uh, and we have also done that in the Smithsonian Institute. So sometimes I- ideas that come forward uh, end up in making changes in our country. That is absolutely great. Jim, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, listening to Minnesota's Progressive Talk, you are on the air, Senator Sanders. Hi. Can you please explain the relationship between banks being too big and the um, destruction of the middle class? Yeah. 
Um, when you have a handful of financial institutions uh, that wield enormous economic and political power, uh, they take actions which benefit themselves, not the rest of the country. And the, what has happened over the years, and where we are right now, is what traditional banking was about. So you put your money into a bank, the bank lends it out for housing, small business, create jobs in the community. The banks were part of what we call the productive economy, helping people buy homes, helping businesses produce products and services. Today, Wall Street is something entirely different. What Wall Street is about to a significant degree is an island unto itself, where its goal is to make money for itself, through, often through incredibly complicated financial transactions, rather than investing in the productive economy and creating jobs for the middle class. That's one area. Second of a- area is you have uh, banks which charge very, very high interest rates. I mean, you're looking at banks that are charge uh, interest rates of 20 or 25 percent uh, on credit cards. That is very uh, deleterious uh, to ordinary uh, people. Uh, thirdly, what you have is a situation today where Wall Street is sitting on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, which they are not investing into the productive economy. So those are just, and, and fourthly, I would say, Wall Street's money and power uh, flows into the political system to a significant degree. And they have a whole lot of say about what the President of the United States does, what does not do, uh, and who gets elected to Congress uh, by shaping campaign contributions that go to certain people and not to other people. Elijah in San Saba, Texas, here on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, Senator Sanders. Do you remember the 1992 election? Yep. <coughs> Yep. You remember what Ross Perot told the American people when he was running against Bill Clinton? Yep, I do, actually. He said, you let the free trade agreements pass in this country, and you're going to hear a sucking sound. It's going to suck every job in this country out. Now, what has happened? Well, I think, Elijah, you make a very, very good point. And uh, I know Ross Perot was laughed at. Uh, the Democrats disagreed with him. That was, uh, in fact, uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Al Gore, I think, uh, uh, had a debate with him. Uh, and the Republican candidate, uh, George Bush, President Bush, uh, disagreed with him uh, as well. Uh, but the truth is, uh, as I think Elijah and Ross Perot told us, uh, trade agreements, these, these uh, unfettered free trade agreements, starting with NAFTA and CAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China and others, primarily uh, written by large corporations with the goal of making it easier for them to shut down in America, move abroad, hire people at low wages, and then be able to bring their products back into this country tariff-free. So I would agree with Elijah that one of the reasons, one of the reasons, not the only one, that we are seeing a collapsing middle class, that wages are going down, has to do with these disastrous trade agreements, I think other reasons have to do with, and not unrelated, by the way, because a lot of the, we have lost over 50,000 manufacturing plants in this country in the last 10 years, uh, and you've seen a decline in trade unionism in this country, the inability of workers to stand up and protect their rights. Uh, so a lot of factors out there for the decline of the middle class, but certainly these unfettered free trade agreements are one of them, and I will tell you, Elijah, there's not one of them that I've ever voted for. Bernie, just uh, 20 seconds left here. Thoughts for the week? Yeah, uh, let's pay attention uh, this coming week to the student loan uh, uh, legislation. Uh, And uh, uh, I hope that we can uh, significantly change the bill that's currently before uh, the uh, the Senate uh, and create a situation that we move toward over the next couple of years, making college affordable for all young people, for all people, not just. In this there you go. Senator Sanders, thanks so much for being with us again. My pleasure, Tom. Thank you. Sanders.senate.gov, Bernie's website. Be sure to check it out. We'll be back with Pastor D. Alexander Bullock about what's going on in Detroit. And then Anything Goes Friday, your calls. Stick around.